Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews live special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest back onto the show. He is the liberal leader of Saskatchewan, so the Saskatchewan liberal leader, and he is currently running for the upcoming by-election that has yet to be called in Saskatoon, Miwasin, Jeff Walters. Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Chris. Nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. Um, let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. So usually I start the interviews off the same way, but because you're a returning guest, I don't have to do that. So I don't have to ask you about your duty to serve. If you want to listen to that, people who are tuning in, go back and listen to our first interview with Jeff back in February. But before we actually get into this interview, I want to take a moment and say... Uh, we may experience some internet issues. Uh, we we all know that uh, the internet is one of these fickle things that can tune in and tune out from time to time. If something happens, we will take a quick break and hopefully we'll both be able to reconnect and we'll continue the interview. So if we do take a quick break, please bear with us because we will be back and we will try to bring this full interview to you together live. But also... If you have questions throughout the next 45 minutes, please write them in the YouTube comments and we will try to get Jeff to answer them at the end of the episode. Once we're, I'm done with my questions, we'll take some of your questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to message them in the YouTube comments and Jeff is happily willing to take some of your questions as well. But Jeff, let's start with the big news. You've decided as the Liberal leader to announce that you were the candidate in the upcoming yet-to-be-called by-election in Saskatoon, Wewasin. Why did you make that decision as someone who is from Regina? Well, to me, it was actually a pretty easy decision. Although we did have a fair amount of interest uh, with regard to some other people wanting to step up in the area. But Realistically, it's one of the three areas that we had targeted beforehand when I first became leader that I would actually run in. And the reason for that is that I grew up there. I spent 20 years of my life there. I went to elementary school, high school there. My first job was there. I have an attachment to the area that goes well beyond um, almost every other place I've lived so far. And really, I mean, if we want to push it so far, actually, my first son was born there. So we have that connection. And really, the characteristics are basically myself. I mean, my father lived there up until a few months ago and passed away. And really it's, you know, working class values that um, has been instilled with me. And that's, you know, something that I understand within that particular constituency. It's a natural fit for me. And I really do challenge my competitors to, you know, um, compare their pedigree with mine and, you know, see how it matches up. We have a lot to discuss over the next few uh, 45 minutes. So we're going to talk about your run in the by-election and what you're hearing at the doorsteps. But I want to talk about the thing that's on everyone's mind right now, and that's affordability. Inflation is a big thing that is affecting not only me, not only you, but everyone, no matter what economic class you're from and where you live. Um, there was a report out of CTV News in Saskatoon this morning uh, where they said that parents are concerned about the affordability about going back to school for their children. The cost of school supplies are going up, but wages aren't going up. Um, when you're talking to people in Saskatoon, Miwasin, whether you're talking to people across Saskatchewan, what are you telling them about this liberal platform and the liberal pledge to help fight affordability and keep it low so that way parents can afford to send their kids back to school with the necessary supplies they need and will want during the school year. Right, well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, if we take a step back and just think of why um, at this moment in time inflation has gone crazy and why affordability has gone up in comparison, we really just have to think about some really just conditions of where our world is right now. We have conflict. Uh, right now that we haven't had before. Um, we've had social groups that have conflict in themselves, plus wars. Climate change is obviously changing our planet as we speak. We can see this with droughts or whatnot. And really, it just comes down to how that affects you know, the status quo of how the world actually works and our chain of supply or whatnot. And governments have a role to play. They're not necessarily the cause of inflations, but their policies can actually help or hinder. And so our goal is to find ways in which, as a provincial government, we can help. And there are things that we can do to help with affordability. I mean, it comes down to even just the more simple things as, you know, repealing the PST increases that's the present government in the last budget. 
I mean, that in itself, at a time when affordability goes up, people don't need to be taxed more. It just doesn't have a certain amount of sense to it. And so that can be changed. But also there's other things as well. We also see that SASC Energy and SAS Power are increasing their rates exponentially. SASC Energy is going up 24%. And we have to remember what Brown corporations are. They're not for-profit entities. They're there to serve folks in Saskatchewan. And at a time when our provincial government is actually sitting on a windfall revenue from oil and gas or whatnot, sitting on it and basically doing nothing with it at the moment, to have people's cost of living go up, especially with crown corporations that they can control, and yet to do nothing but let those things go up, it just hinders. And so our job is to take a more comprehensive approach of how we can help people in Saskatchewan. And it comes down to our motto, which really is, you know, the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. And so what can we do as a provincial government within our purview to help people with affordability? And there's certain things. We have certain um, income tax reform to help people, especially people in the lower economic um, scale who have jobs but find that income tax is actually degrading their paycheck, um, even though they're having problems just you know, meeting, you know, making men's meet. We also have certain um, social programs with the help um, people with regard to um, um, disabilities or whatnot that help as well. But it comes down to, of course, making other things affordable and not adding extra burdens, such as education and health. And those are other issues we're obviously going to tackle eventually. We, you talked about the energy prices, and we all know that energy prices are continuously going up, and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight here. Um, with the winter coming and energy prices spiking, and while well, we're just in the middle of summer, and usually your energy prices are lower in the summer because you're not using as much, whether it be the furnace, whether it be heating, but energy prices are going up. You talked about some of the ways that we can handle and deal with the cost of things going up and the supply chain. How do we do that? Do we need to be refining more energy within our own province, within Saskatchewan, or do we need to be looking at interprovincial uh, trade so that way we, within Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, start trading back and forth energy so that way we can keep the cost low, but also do a made in Canada solution? Yep, those are some good ideas. We do know that really the future is not where it is right now. The future is, of course, the transition into green technologies. And this is not, at the end of the day, this is not um, us pushing some pie in the sky thing. This is a reality that is going to happen, whether we like it or not. And we can you know, choose to ignore it and pretend that it's not going to affect us. And then when it comes down the road, try and play catch up, which will only be more painful or more costly. Or we can deal with that reality now and become leaders of how this goes forward. And so transitioning towards a green or a green energy sector is the most plausible solution. A classic example, the Athabasca wind farm that just opened up in Southern Saskatchewan. It has enough capacity to actually provide energy for a hundred thousand homes. Think about that for a second. How many homes do you think are in Saskatchewan? And that can actually handle capacity for that. And so there are solutions that are already here that we can use towards transitioning. Another example, of course, is Manitoba Hydro that actually exports its hydroelectricity. That's something that, especially in the eastern parts of Saskatchewan, if we get a power grid that actually can work with it, that's something that we can pursue as well. So there's multiple options here. And unfortunately, we've had um, the SAS party government that has actually been kind of been conflicting with regard to their policies in this area. They pulled the solar panel and the solar energy um, uh, tax grants or whatnot. And really they decided to go for um, 100% into nuclear to the expense of everything else, which is probably fine except nuclear is a technology that even if it starts bearing fruit, it won't be for another 10, 15 years down the road. It doesn't help us now. And so there's many things that we can do, but the worst thing in the world is to do nothing and then just hope for the best. So certain things can be pushed forward as we speak. Things are happening as we speak that we can actually promote a little bit better, fund a bit better, and make it much more macro, much more intensive. You said during your um, launch, your campaign launch in Saskatoon, Miwasan, that Saskatchewan politics is broken. And you just mentioned Premier Scott Moe there for a few seconds, so I want to stick on this vein here for a few minutes, if that's po if that's okay. Yeah. From an outsider's perspective, uh, looking at politics in general, mm -hmm. I've never been elected, I've never held any political office, I've ran politically, but I've never held any political office. Um, 
we seem to have governments that are more reactive than proactive. They don't want to do things to make things better. They want to react to what the day-to-day -day issues are. When you say it, when you said in your campaign launch that Saskatchewan politics is broken, what did you mean by that? And do you place the blame squarely at the feet of Scott Moe? Or is there a larger conflicting matter that's going on in Saskatchewan that people aren't noticing right now from the outsiders looking in? Well, it's interesting perspective. And, you know, it's easy just to blame a single person or a single entity, right? If I were to blame somebody, it would be that dastardly Justin Trudeau. We can use him as a straw man for everything that's evil. But the fact remains is that this is a more systematic issue. And really, it kind of started in 2003. And when I say it's broken, I mean that participation and confidence in government has gone down exponentially. And so, in, for example, in 2003, voter turnout for the general election was, in fact, 76% which is quite impressive. And there's a reason why it was so high. And in 2003, um, after 2003 and succeeding elections, there have been less and less voter turnout, less and less um, engagement in politics. Until we get to 20, the 2020 general election, we're down to 52%, which means that almost 50% of the population chose not to engage at all. And so what happened between 2003 and 2020 is that we've slowly become, Saskatchewan politics has slowly become what we call a binary system where we've gone from multiple parties with um, multiple platforms and you know abilities to actually you know give people choice in how they want to vote and viable choices too. In 2003, we had the NDP, the SAS party, the Liberals, which SAS Liberals, which were still viable under David Carwacky, and other groups coming in. And it was very, um, shall we say, open with regard to choice for the voter. Um, fast forward to 2020, and that's just not the case. So we're stuck with only what folks think are only two viable parties. In and if those two parties do not reflect their values, if those two parties do not reflect what folks actually want, and then there's a tendency to do one of two things, either vote against something or just not vote at all. And more and more people, it seems, are not voting at all. And so when I say our politics is broken, I'm, I mean that our democracy is hinging on an almost Americanized style of one or two parties at the expense of giving voters and folks actual choice on issues and people that can best reflect them. And to me, that is a problem. How do we fix it then? I, I know you are the leader of a party and you would say have people like myself run, but you need to be out there and you're one person. Are you growing the party right now? Because earlier on in the year, uh, I think in February when we last talked, you had just become the leader like in a few months. So you were still getting the ground game going and still learning the ropes. But now you've launched a new uh, uh, logo. You've rebranded the party. But how do you do that? Because you need to keep the momentum up and you're going to be focusing on Saskatoon Miwasin at the by-election. But what do you do between now and then to make people understand that there is that other option out there? There are other options out there instead of that binary option that people think they might only have in Sask Saskatchewan. Yeah, that's a fair point. And you know what? It's um, it's interesting to actually become leader of a party that has trough, that's basically, you know, almost cease to exist to try and make it relevant again. And that's kind of an issue that's, you know, most parties have. And so what what can we do and what have we been doing? Well, since October when I, of last year, when I first became leader, we've doubled our membership, which helps. Uh, but we also have been trying to take over and control of our own narrative, which means trying to get back out in the public eye, trying to, con you know, converse and talk with folks on the ground, trying to get out in the media. And it's a tough task. It really is. But it's worth it because... For every person we talk to, that's one more person that knows they have another choice that's available to them. And so that's something that's very important. But ultimately, it's going to come down to us showing that we do have the chops to be able to pull it off. I mean, talk is cheap. I can sit here and talk the world, but it doesn't mean anything unless we actually have a victory or something that can be construed as a victory. A Saskatoon Miwasin is a great proving ground because the way things are going, it looks like perhaps every single party is going to have a candidate. And it's going to be a very um, interesting macro snapshot into Saskatchewan politics to see where everybody kind of is. And so if we can show our viability, there are many people, I am convinced and I believe, will come out and once again support us, those that used to and those that want to. Very few people want to attach themselves on a wagon that feels not going anywhere. So our job is to show that we are going somewhere. And when that happens, I predict that there will be a, a very nice snowball effect. Because people are looking... And people are wishing 
but looking and wishing only goes so far. And so we have to show people that we're serious and that we can actually do what we say we're going to do. We we want to talk about the by-election in depth here. And one of the big things that I think most people are worried about right now with COVID ending, with the backlog of surgeries that the provincial government is saying we're going to be sending to Alberta to help because we don't, we can't, our capacity isn't there right now. Um, when you're talking to the people of the by, uh, the riding of uh, Saskatoon, Miwasan, are they talking about health care? Are they talking about the issue that I had to put off my surgery because there was an overload of the healthcare system. Is healthcare a big factor in the riding? Oh, well, healthcare is always a big factor. <laughs> That's just the reality of the situation. And when we have been canvassing, and I love canvassing, you actually get a chance to talk with you know actual folks on the ground, you know, rather than perhaps you know posting a tweet or something. It's much more personal, and I enjoy that. And what we've been hearing the most, one, of course, is just accountability in general. They feel that their government's gotten away from them. Um, there's a solid argument for that, which perhaps we can touch on later. But affordability is a big one. And affordability is not just um, not just their income or taxes or increases in SASC energy. Affordability, of course, is health care. It's education, like you mentioned before. And I knew we'd loop around to this eventually. Um, health care is a big deal for pretty much everybody. I mean, I just... Personally, I experienced that with my daughter with special needs. I just experienced that with my father who just passed away. Um, it's a big deal. And the problem that we've been having is that we've had, unfortunately, our provincial government that's been kind of sinking money, but sinking money into brick and mortar and not in actual people. And so it's great to have a building, but if you have no staff, that doesn't mean anything. And that's where the issue and problem is right now, for the most part, in healthcare. It's a lack of staffing, and the people who are staffed are working ridiculous hours and burning out, making matters worse. And so you see that unfortunate folks will have to be shipped out to Alberta or Manitoba or Ontario, whatever it takes for them to get you know, basic health care taken care of, or perhaps a bit more. That's not what the cradle of health care or Medicare that Saskatchewan is supposed to be. It's not what we're supposed to stand for. And so it's more of a smart moving of allocation of resources into things that actually matter, not just a building, but in people. And that's really where the focus should be. And it really blows my mind that we have, unfortunately, a, a system here where it's crumbling before our eyes. But yet our provincial government has chosen to spend this summer, you know, basically golfing and going on autonomy tours than actually addressing you know, the actual tangible problems that people are experiencing. I just, it's incomprehensible to me. So how do we do that? Because uh, you're not the only province that's having this issue right now. Here in Alberta, uh, healthcare workers over the last two years have been struggling, and I'm assuming it's the same in Saskatchewan. Uh, they're tired. They are causing of concerns of not being able to go into work because of PTSD. Uh, they are unsure about their future because they don't. They want to give back, but they see better opportunities in other provinces. So, how do you attract the healthcare workers to your province? in a tangible way, because you talk about we don't need the brick and mortar, but we need people. But when every other province needs people as well, it's a fight against provinces. And how does Saskatchewan come out on top in a battle over the best of the best when it comes to the nursing staff, the cardiologists, the doctors, the people who need to be in those hospitals to make it work properly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not the only you know, jurisdiction that's having this issue. Let's be clear about that. It's a systemic one, and there's no easy answer with regard to a systemic issue. Um, in fact, one of the big things that I would like to push, whether I'm in government or not, is the establishment of a health and social policy council of experts and advisors, of people that know what they're doing in this province to get together and give us some tangible you know, options. I mean, it's, it's interesting that decisions are being made, and when you ask whether, how the decision is made, um, no expert agrees with it. There's, nobody actually owns up to where these where this is coming from. I mean, if I want to ask my 12-year-old daughter policy issues and then follow it, is that really what Saskatchewan needs? We need actual people who can give us actual solutions. Now, that's one thing to give us something of a more systemic thing, but to get people to come back or even just to be involved in Saskatchewan, there's a few things that we can do necessarily. I mean, we do have, of course, two rather large university institutions here. 
And we do have people who are in the healthcare industry that are getting their degrees here. If we make it worth their while, there's a good chance that they might stay. And that's something that a government can very well do. Now, if it takes tax incentives, that's great. If it takes reevaluating and reimagining the entire education system, especially post-secondary, I'm okay with that too. There are regions and jurisdictions in this world that do have free education and post-secondary for those who are actually residents. That's something I would definitely pursue and it would attract many people who would like to stay here afterwards after they get the degree and help out. So there are things that we can do, but we just have to think more out of the box and actually listen to experts, both on the ground and otherwise, to find reasonable solutions that can work. I want, I want to turn to accountability, accountability and the government. You, you mentioned in your statement a few minutes ago about uh, what you're hearing on the ground in Saskatoon, Miwasan, and what you're hearing is uh, people are losing faith in their government. People are losing faith in uh, Scott Moe and the Saskatchewan party. What do you mean by that? How are they losing faith? What are they telling you about what they're not seeing from this government, whether it be accountability or uh, the focus on issues that are important to the people of Saskatchewan? Well, those things are pretty much linked. If you believe that your government is not um, focused on the issues that you care about most and you try to make your voice heard, and you're ignored, and you still see a provincial government or a government official that does things that you are trying to understand why, right, and they are not accountable to or responsive to people. That's the very definition of accountability issues. And so accountability and everything else is built into the problems that we have. Now, accountability is a loaded word. Everybody throws it around. That's great. But there are things. There's the implication that our government tends to only respond to special interests or only respond to you know, people who you know, donate to them. And it really is a symptom of a larger problem of what we have in Saskatchewan, in that, that our political donation or political finance system is called the Wild West because there are basically no restrictions. A good chunk of money flows into Saskatchewan from interest groups that don't even live in Saskatchewan, both East and West and otherwise. And so if and we can somehow mitigate that, if we can somehow do something about that, then that would go a long way into having regular folks perhaps be heard. If there's just individual donations for people who live in Saskatchewan that's capped out, um, political parties will have no choice but to listen to those people who fund them. And that's my belief. And so I've been pushing very hard. It's one of the things that if Saskatoon wants and graces me with um, the pleasure and the the responsibility of actually you know, representing them in the legislature. This is one of the things we're going to push is political donation, political finance reform that will put caps, that will ensure that political parties, regardless of whatever strike they are, are more responsive to regular individuals, regular folks, and not beholden to special interests that don't even live in the province. That It's fine and dandy. That's great to hear of things that you want to do, but I'm going to be I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate with you here, Jeff, because I, I like to do that on this show from time to time. You get elected. What's stopping you from not doing anything that you said? Because we've all heard these great things from politicians from years gone by and every campaign they come out with great promises of we're going to cap things, we're going to do things differently. But when they get into office, they don't. They are the same old, same old politician. So what gives the people of Saskatoon Miwasan the the glimmer of hope that a, a an election of a Jeff Walters, the Saskatchewan Liberal leader, is going to be different than the previous elections that they've elected an NDP MLA or a Sask Party MLA? How are you different? Because I think there's a lot of people out there that is looking for different but they can't trust politicians because the trust of a politician is very, very thin right now because they've all broken promises. I get that. Um, I was one of those people. <laughs> I absolutely get that. And it's one of the reasons um, why I chose to be engaged um, for the first point. It was not about power or anything like that. It was basically because I wanted to help based upon my personal situation and that with my daughter and whatnot. So I got into it primarily to do exactly what I'm doing. But there's a few things. I mean, that's talk, right? 
what I like to do is point out my actions so far that show that my intentions. First, I do not accept any donations, neither is my party, any donations for any corporation or any union. And we don't accept it. We only accept individual donations. And so we're not beholden to other entities that somehow would affect us or try and push certain policy ideas, right? I'm very much not um, interested in being just a mouthpiece for special interests. And I've proven that in my actions because we don't do that. Um, second, if I am elected and if I do get to the legislature, I am not part of a party that would be caucused or whipped, which means that I don't have any line to follow or toe except for my own in the legislature if I'm elected. And so everything I'm saying will easily be my own and be able to actually articulate and put out there without having to worry about somebody trying to hold me in place. But I'll be very much that free agent that will be allowed to actually push these things. And so at the end of the day, I think I'm the perfect vessel for change in the legislature that is actually need to have a different voice in that. I mean, let's be realistic about the Saskatoon wants some by-election for a second. So there are certain things that are just inevitable, but whatever the outcome is, so the SAS party is still going to be the government. We know that. Um, the NDP is still going to be the official opposition. We know that. The only difference is whatever the outcome is, either we're going to have the same status quo of either a SAS party or NDP are going in there, the, the same for the last 15 years. How's that been treating us? Or you can have a brand new voice in there pushing something different without an agenda that's anything other than what we're articulating right now. So there is hope for change and hope for a different voice that can happen. This is the point and the realism of this by-election coming up. Either more of the same or something completely different that actually changes Saskatchewan politics. Are it people open? Whatever that vote. I'm sorry? Are people open to this? Because when you're knocking on doors, because I know you've been out door knocking, you don't seem like a guy who would announce and then go away and not do anything until a by-election <laughs> is called. You you will yeah. you, you were on the ground door knocking in your old neighborhood because you used to live in the uh, the riding. What are people do people have hope that change could happen or what are you hearing at the doorstep? Because at the end of the day, you have to address the people who, of this uh, constituency, Saskatoon, Miwasan, and their issues. So what are you the issues that you're hearing? Are there local issues that you're, they're talking about? Are they talking about the bigger grand scheme of Sask Saskatchewan politics? What are they talking about and are they open to change? Yes, well, the, I mean, the obvious local conditions are essentially just affordability, as we talked about already. And that's what everybody's feeling. I mean, I'm feeling it. I'm sure everyone who's listening right now is feeling it. I'm sure you are, too, in Alberta are feeling it. I mean, this is a different time. These are unstable times. And all of us are feeling that burden. And so that, of course, always comes up. But what also is underlying all this, the big picture, is a state of pessimism that the government no longer works for them and there's no other options. And that just comes up. And when we try our best, when I try my best to engage and let them know what we can do and what the stakes are for the by-election, yes, there are people that do raise their eyebrows and do consider it because it really is a viable consideration to presume that something can actually change if they actually decide to vote. Now, whether they do so or not, of course, is entirely up to them, but there is an openness to it just by virtue of where we are right now in our politics. Uh, again, we go back to the lack of turnout. We go back to the 15 years of the status quo. And let's be honest, here, very few people are probably very happy with the current political situation in Saskatchewan who aren't party acolytes, right? And that's what we're trying to convey. Now, we'll obviously find out whatever the outcome is, how this actually works in the end. But... I'm comfortable in at least giving people of Saskatoon and Watson an actual viable alternative and choice this time around. And that's my job to try and convey to them. So I, I just want to take a moment here before we go into our last segment here, and then we'll start wrapping up. But for my listeners on the website and people who are watching via YouTube right now, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the notes, and we will try to answer, ask uh, Jeff some of these questions that are coming in. Uh, we do have a few that have already come in through the website, so I'm looking forward to getting to those. They're more about rural issues because we have a very large following up in Maidstone, Lloydminster area. So hopefully you're willing to talk 
talk about some rural issues as well in a few minutes. But I want to talk about the six priorities that the, that you're running on, that the Saskatchewan Liberals are running on. It seems like you've bottlenecked yourself, and this is just me looking at it, because with six priorities, you have to encompass a lot of things that are important to people. How did these six priorities come about? Was it your consultations while going across the province, talking to people, or were these people from the party who said these are the six important issues of Saskatchewan, so we need to talk about these and only these six issues? But well, I'm glad you mentioned that. And it's a very important distinction because these six priorities are issues. If you go to sasthergoals.ca and open them up, uh, they do encompass a lot of things, but how they're organized is through six. So it actually is quite comprehensive. And same with my own website, Jeff Walters, um, SK.ca. How this came about was actually a combination of what you mentioned. Um, we did have a, um, a party AGM back in March, a policy convention to hammer most of this home. And a lot of whose influence was in fact, when I first became leader and went out and talked with folks across the province as much as I could before COVID shut everything down and listened to what they had to say. Now, if you look at what we actually have for our, what we call our vision, um, it's much different than what the party was before. It's really is much more in depth and covers many more issues. A lot of it is modern. And that's one thing that I myself personally want to try and convey that Saskatchewan can be a modern province. Saskatchewan can be forward-looking. Saskatchewan can be leaders. It just takes um, the fortitude of somebody to come up and be that vessel to be able to push forward. And that's what I hope to be, right? And that's how it works out. So it really was a combination of things. But you mentioned six points, but those six points are very um, dense. And again, I for anyone out there listening, I do challenge you to look at those six priorities, look go to either the party website or my website and compare them with the NDP, compare them with the SAS party and what they have. And if it's something that you, know, you can make your own decision on what's better and what's not, just the information alone is out there for you and we challenge you to do so. Chris, I lost your audio. There we go. I, I turned it off there because I took, I took a swig of while uh, drink there for a second. But I just, for transparency's sake, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that the links to Jeff's website, the links to Jeff's uh, the liberal, the Saskatchewan Liberal website, the links to Jeff's social media accounts are all in the show notes. So scroll down instead of trying to figure out where they are. You can just click on the link and it will take you right to the pages that you need to, and then you can do some more investigation. Um, I want to leave on this question before we jump into some audience participation, as we always like to call it. Again, if you want to, uh, we have a few more that have come in. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on the website, please type in your uh, your questions to Jeff and we'll a a ask some of them. Um, why you? Why, why should the people of Saskatoon Miwasin put their faith in you to be the, your next MLA? We've talked about a lot of things over the last 40 minutes, but it all comes down to why you? So why should people vote for you in this yet-to-be-called by-election? <laughs> well, I appreciate it. <clears throat> and I believe it just comes down to that I'm an honest broker, that I'm not beholden to special interest or party interest necessarily because I am the leader of my party. Um, there's a lot that I can offer, and I've put myself out there. And anybody can check on me. Anyone can check on everything that I've posted, all of my ideas. They're all out there for public consumption. I'm hiding nothing. And so what I bring is a breath of fresh air, hopefully, and a, what I think is a voice for the voiceless, that when people stop participating in our democracy, um, we have a problem with democracy. If people feel they don't have a voice, that is a problem. And so I'm aiming to be a voice for those people and try my best. Now, here's the thing. Like everything I say, everything I put out, um, there are gonna be things that people will disagree with. No two humans are the same. Right? No one's going to agree with me 100%. But at the end of the day, when you're making your decision, when folks make their decision, I hope that they are informed and they know with my heart on my sleeve what I stand for. And if it's something that appeals to them, take the chance. Because once we do that, once we break the ice out of this binary and give actual choice, not just for elections coming up, but for the legislature, things in Saskatchewan will absolutely change. And this is what Saskatoon Watson is all about. This is the proving ground. If we can do it here, everything changes. 
Perfect. Now we will go to some audience questions. And I don't have some names for some of these people because they're usernames. So I do apologize right now for everyone. I'm just going to ask the question. Uh, one of them, and this is from the website, is does the Saskatchewan Liberal Party have a policy on the agriculture sector as a, I am a farmer in rural Saskatchewan? Yes, we do. We absolutely do. It's not on our website right now because it came after our AGM, our policy convention. We do have it. I challenge you, whoever that is, to email me um, if they can, either through the party or my website, and I can actually forward you the document of what our ideas are. It just hasn't made it to our website yet because it came after our event. But we actually have a comprehensive agriculture policy, I promise you that. I think that it's important for any party in Saskatchewan to make a concerted effort to at least try and engage everybody, and that includes rural areas, right? If you don't show up, why would anybody want to trust you? So we are showing up, and we do have a policy. So please contact me, and I will absolutely send you it. Again, from the website, you spoke about autonomy earlier, earlier in the interview, I'm assuming. What's your position on autonomy with Ottawa? Well, autonomy is a great catchword, but what does it really mean? And that's kind of what we have to like dance around. Autonomy, when we think about it for a second, we are in fact a federation, we're a confederation, and everybody works within certain rules for the most part. It doesn't do Saskatchewan a whole lot of good talking autonomy unless we actually flesh out what that's supposed to mean. And so it's a nice buzzword in order to rile up certain people and hopefully try and get them a certain way or vote in a certain way, then it is to actually put some meat on the bones and see what it actually means. And so really what's unfortunately what um, the provincial government's doing right now with their autonomy tour and where the areas are going in, it's a concerted political effort for them, a crass political effort to try and regain the right of their base, right? That they feel that the Buffalo party and other parties are nipping at. It's really just crass politics than it is actually anything substantive, in my opinion. And that's something that I don't condemn. So if you want to talk about autonomy, put some meat on the bones and see what it means. Otherwise, confederation it is. Two last questions here, and this one is about... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this as nicely as possible because there's a few things in here, but I want to put you on the spot here for a quick second here. Um, okay. There is concern that the Saskatchewan Liberal Party is the Liberal Party of Ottawa. Can you make the difference between the two parties for the people who are listening to this now and later? Because there's some concern that you're just uh, you're running for Justin Trudeau and not running for Jeff Walters. Right. Well, that would be interesting <laughs> if I was running for Justin Trudeau. <clears throat> I've never met the man, never talked to the man, but I'm sure he's pleasant. The fact remains is that the Saskatchewan Liberal Party has not been affiliated with the federal Liberal Party since 2009. We've detached ourselves from that law. Now, that doesn't mean that somehow you know, we have to be anti or for something. What it means is that our focus is provincial. We follow prairie liberalism, which is what this province was actually founded on, right, historically. Our issues are provincial issues. Now, if that means that you know, we have to, at certain points, shake our fist at Ottawa, whoever the government is, to, for the best interests of the province, we will. But it doesn't mean we're in lockstep with Ottawa. However, if they do something good for the province, why not celebrate it as well? I mean, what's the fear in that? If they help us, great, we're on board. If they don't, we shake our fists and we're angry. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're a provincial party. Now, one thing, though, is what's not helpful, is for a provincial government to portray the federal government is somehow poisonous or the enemy. That to me is politically damaging, but also difficult when cooperation is needed, right? We still live in a confederation. A lot of our funding does come from Ottawa. Ottawa does give us a lot of money for a lot of our programs. A more healthy relationship is one based upon mutual respect and cooperation, not painting each other as the enemy. So that being said, and we are a provincial party. We always, well, we have been since 2009, and we always will be. And our concerns are ex exclusively provincial. And the last question before we wrap up here, Jeff, is about a subject that you talked about a little bit earlier on and when we were talking about natural resources, and that is nuclear. Is there a position on the 
uh, Saskatchewan. What does the the do, does the Saskatchewan Liberals have a policy around nuclear energy and the uranium exploration within the province of Saskatchewan? Right. And I'm glad this is mentioned. Um, part of our green transition, and you can check this out on the websites, party or myself. It includes pretty much everything. And the reason for that is there's no silver bullet out there with regard to green transition. You can't say, oh, it's solar or bust. You can't say it's this or bust. In truth, it's going to be a medley of different varieties that's going to come together to help us get to where we need to be. And so where does nuclear play on this? I have no problems whatsoever in doing the research into nuclear technology. We have the University of Saskatchewan that can literally do that. And that's a good thing to do the research, to see what's viable and what's not. But realistically, again, if we're talking about SMRs or nuclear, it's not an immediate solution. It'll take five years just to get the licensing at least, another 10 years to do all this, the impact studies and the, the lawsuits that come with it, and then probably another 10 years before you even actually get one commission, if you get one commissioned at all. It's not a quick solution, but I'm not opposed to researching it with what we have available, because we do have institutions available that can do it. And that's something that you know, we can at least entertain the aspect and actually push forward in a research capacity and see what happens in it. In the interim, we can use things that are already there, such as the wind farms as we've shown in Assiniboine, or also, of course, Manitoba Hydro that we can probably have a deal with, and solar, which we know works. These things can be an interim solution. So it's a mix and match, and nothing out there, again, is a silver bullet. It's going to take a whole lot of different ways to work in tandem for us to get to where we need to be. Now, I, I did say that was going to be the last question, but this, this, <laughs> th there's been a few of these questions. So, And I know the answer, but I want to let you answer this as well. Um, you live in Regina. You're running for someone uh, uh, riding in Saskatoon. How will you be able to represent a riding that you no longer live in? Oh, well, it's quite easy. We um, move there. <laughs> <laughs> there uh, it's not... Not the hardest um, answer in the world, actually. And it's true, actually, my wife and I, if, again, if Saskatoon and Wasson puts their trust in me, which I'd be forever grateful, um, the very next thing we're going to do is move into the district and move into the constituents. We already picked out a house. <laughs> we kind of push it a little forward. We know what we're going to do if it comes to that. Absolutely. And again, I mean, I have a, I lived half my life there. <laughs> I'm comfortable with the area. I love the area. And as I mentioned before, my first son, you know, his first few, first few years of life was living in that area. We have a connection to that area. And I have no problems pulling up stakes and moving there. And in fact, I actually am kind of hoping that I like, you know, I get the opportunity because I have a nostalgia for where I grew up. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for doing this, answering my questions, answering some of the audience's questions that came in through the website. Um, again, we'll just do a quick little shout out just to make sure if anyone has any last minute questions on YouTube, because we didn't get any from YouTube. We got them all from our website. YouTube, if you have any questions, send them in right now, because if not, we're going to wrap up here. I'll give it a few seconds. But, Jeff, um, I want to remind everyone the links are in the show notes to Jeff's social media page, website, so the party's website. Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor, and I'm always happy to have you on the show to talk about Saskatchewan politics, but also uh, give people options, because that's what we need in this world is options, and people need to be able to have make a decision for themselves and not be stuck into that binary path that they've been stuck in for so long. So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Kristen. It's always fun to talk with you. And when, and I know you're going to, when you come, it's asked to me, Watson, let me know. All right, we'll hang out. And you can ask me more questions if you wish or whatever the case may be, but I'd love to see you in person for once, and that's it'd be awesome if we could do that. Well, you just broke my last new I was about to announce that, but when <laughs> when okay. <laughs> good job, Jeff. Oh, no. Politician <laughs> scooping the story from the journalist. Always good. <laughs> But when the by-election is called in Saskatoon, Miwasin, we are going to be heading up. We're going to be taking the show on the road. We're going into Saskatoon, and we're going to – my old stomping ground when I was a reporter up at Lloydminster, I reported on a few uh, things in Saskatoon for a while. So we're going to be going there, and we're going to be doing a week-long uh, series of shows there in Saskatoon live each day with some of the candidates if we can get them all on, but also seeing what they're talking about on the ground in Saskatoon, Miwasin. So 
Jeff, thank you so much for doing this once again. Greatly appreciate it, as always, to have you on the show. Uh, good luck. I say that to all the candidates. So anyone who's about to yell at me for saying, oh, you only have the liberals. We've reached out to the NDP. They've ghosted us like the 13-year-old uh, teenage girl. And we've reached out to the Saskatchewan party, and no one's gotten back to us from there. Uh, we But we are in conversations with a few other parties. But we want to make sure that we promote democracy as much as possible and give people the options to hear from the candidates themselves because we know in this world it's hard to hit every single door in every single riding during the election so let's bring them to you live with questions and answers so jeff once again thank you so much for doing this Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening live via the website and listening live via YouTube. Uh, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get out from behind social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation because it makes our democracy better. It makes our society better and just makes us better as people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.